Um, you both had terrible experiences in your lives, and yet you've gone on. And, and could you discuss um, from memory why, uh, what what produces in people remembering the better, the good experiences as opposed to the very bad experiences? I, I, I mean, from a scientific standpoint, if there's been any work on that, why people remember the good, or why they re some people remember the bad or the worst experiences over take control over the good experiences or those memories? You want to try that? It's a biological question. Well, it's, it's a, no, it's a psychological question as well. No, I can't answer this question. I, um, I, I think this must depend on character types. Uh, I'm a delusional optimist. <laughs> Denise is less so. I think she's much more realistic than I am. Um, I'm the pessimist. Huh? I'm You're the pessimist. pessimist. You're a pessimist. <laughs> Uh, we complement each other in that way very well. Um, you know, you can, there were wounds every day. You can lick your wounds all day long. But uh, I get such a kick out of the good things that happen. And, you know, they're few and far between. I've got enormous pleasure out of it. And I squeeze a lot of pleasure out of everyday life. I'm enjoying myself a great deal here. Um, so I think it must be character structure in part. My father was very optimistic. Now look, I can never get over, and you remember in the movie, the, the um, Kurt Weiss, the telephone call, uh, when we were at the train station going to Antwerp to get the, the, the ship that took us to America. My parents were letting go of their children. You know, I was nine, my brother was 14, we were crossing the Atlantic by ourselves. I mean, the courage, the optimism that they must have had. I don't think for a moment it dawned on them that they would not join us. And there was a very good chance. My father was arrested several days before he left. And if he did not have an American visa, he would never have escaped a concentration camp. So twice he was arrested, and both times he was able to talk himself out of it. The first time was Kristallnacht, and he showed, he documented the fact that he had fought in the First World War. In the early days of the Hitler era, they treated people who had fought in the First World War as somewhat different than others. I mean, they took a store away, but they didn't send him to concentration camp. He was then arrested just before he left, and he had doc. In the early days, Hitler was not interested in killing Jews, except on ex you know, exceptional cases. He wanted to get them out. And if they could go out by themselves and leave their money behind, he was perfectly pleased to have that. And he saw that my parents had nothing and that my father was about to leave, so he let him go. So anyway, this, I'm saying that this optimism is probably sort of a genetically ingrained strain in my family. Yeah, so we have uh, more questions in the third, oh, okay, well, I think three more. In the third, fourth, and sixth row, the lady in the sixth, Sixth row. Um, I have a, a somewhat simple-minded question I wanted to ask based on what I saw in the film. Um, when nerve cells uh, in the brain connect, um, I assume that they're all more or less identical. Can they distinguish an individual nerve cell? Can it distinguish itself from other nerve cells? Does a nerve cell avoid connecting with itself? Is this bad? And if so, how does it do it? What is your name, sir? Marty. Marty, that's brilliant. That is absolutely brilliant. The whole key to the brain is the precision with which nerve cells form neural circuits. And there are amazingly few errors. And there are cases in which it is planned that a nerve cell feeds back on itself, but that's rarely the case. And for example, the cells that I study a cell will never connect on itself. It doesn't do this in the intact animal, it doesn't do it in culture. So the precision of the nervous system and the amount of um, molecular machinery that is required for one nerve cell to seek out its appropriate partner and ignore all the inappropriate, it's like a shidduch made in heaven. This is a molecular shidduch made in heaven. So there is a last question, the lady with the red scarf, yes, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have two different questions, both of them related to the movie. The first one, you're in front of a Torah and you are overwhelmed by emotions. 
is that a physiological, a physical, a biochemical reaction? That's the first question. And the second one, did you, did the neurobiologist determine what makes a person or a group of people well-educated, civilized, listening to Beethoven and Wagner go and kill a couple thousand people the next day? Uh, yeah, I can answer both of those questions. Um, you know, weeping is an emotional response. It's completely biological, but everything is biological. Our conversation is mediated through the, uh, through our talking, but it really reflects my brain communicating with your brain through a method of speech. So, you know, emotion has many components to it. It involves the amygdala's emotional sources. Ledoux and Tony Damasi have shown. It involves parts of the cortex being involved. It involves autonomic responses. So it's a, you know, it involves a good part of the brain. Um, the second question, um, I've really thought, as I discussed in my book, a lot about, particularly recently, and I've come to the conclusion, the sad conclusion, that this is built into the human genome. Um, the Nazis were awful, um, and the Viennese Nazis were particularly bad, but um, were they unique in being able to kill innocent people? This has happened time and time again. Uh, I think what happens is that there is in any group a leader who may be a psychopath or whatever, uh, and it is very easy for people to follow, and they will follow for several reasons. Uh, one, they're like sheep going to slaughter. They're easily influenced and they will go along. Others will do it for opportunistic reasons. If you fire 50% of the medical faculty at the University of Vienna, including some senior professors, this is a very good opportunity for junior people to move along. So why not support this? You know, it's going to help me. I'm going to bring more money home. I'm going to have a better career. Who, I didn't care for Shmuel Eisenstein to begin with, so why should I support him? Uh, so I think there are a number of reasons that make that go to it, but it's amazing how people, particularly under pressure, either opportunistic pressure or fear, will go along with absolutely dreadful things because there is a part of us that is capable of being highly influenced. There is not one group of people, including the Jews, who've not in one time or another done terrible things. So I don't think this is, you know, built into the German people or built into the Austrians. Andreas and I are working to change things because we think this is the plasticity of the brain. And if we can go to the right, why can't we flip it to the left? So I think this is an unfortunate thing we have to live with, and it is up to society to so build in civil defense measures that this cannot happen. This is why I admire France and even more the United States. There are terrible fascistic tendencies in the United States, but there's so many countervailing factors and there's so many constitutional guarantees that in the most circumstances, and I say most because it's by no means all, this is kept under check. <laughs> Reinhold Niebuhr, the great Protestant theologian, once said, um, the Capability of people for good makes democracy desirable. Their capability for evil makes democracy necessary. And c'est vrai, I think this is absolutely true.